Robert Tierney, uh, you are a professor of literature at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, and your work uh, discusses uh, the Japanese Empire and uh, anti-imperial movements mm -hmm. uh, in Japan in various ways. Uh, how has the Japanese Empire been treated in mainstream studies of global imperial history or post-colonial studies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Japan has been a peripheral subject uh, in the history of global empires uh, because, uh, I mean, there's a, there are a number of peculiar reasons for this, but I think that most studies of empire tend to assume that empire is a Western construct. And Japan's empire fits in an interesting way. I mean, in many ways, Japan's control of places like uh, Korea and Taiwan is very similar to the uh, kind of overseas empires of countries like, you know, uh, Holland, uh, uh, Britain, France. Uh, it, it, it's, it's unlike uh, the Russian Empire or the Chinese Empire or uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it's not a continental style of empire. So it's very similar structurally, economically. Uh, in many ways, it resembles these empires. But Japan, as an, as an Asian country, I think is, is almost invisible within, or traditionally, I think it's been invisible within global empires. And it's studied primarily by people that study East Asian history or culture. Um, that it, it, you know, it, partly I think that reflects uh, the difficulty of getting materials, of doing research without knowing the relevant languages. But I think another reason may be that, uh, uh, you know, the Japanese, Japanese attitude, the attitude of Japan is basically, they were just copying the, uh, uh, what Western powers were doing at that time. Uh, and so I think maybe that uh, reflects an unwillingness to take the empire on, and see the empire in its own terms. And uh, uh, I mean, actually, I think there are certain differences between Japan and, let's say, Britain, uh, which make the Japanese empire uh, quite distinctive, let's say, or unique. However, I, I also feel that there are many elements of the Japanese, maybe the British Empire is also exceptional in many ways, and that the Japanese have more in common with many other later, later empires like Italy or uh, Spain. Or, uh, one of my colleagues uh, looks at the relationship, for example, between uh, Morocco and Spain. And uh, it, one of the interesting things about this is that the, uh, the Spanish will claim that Andalusia uh, is, shows the sameness of these cultures. And I, I said, oh, that's so interesting because the Japanese empire also employed this rhetoric of identity and uh, sameness between colonizer and colonized. So w one of the things that I hope to see in the future is more attention to maybe fitting the Japanese into this wider history of global empire. In your opinion, what can the study of Japanese imperialism offer post-colonial studies? I, you know, I think uh, it is, on the one hand, this uh, expanding empire beyond simply the West and the non-West, because Japan will undo that binary if we, if we take the empire seriously. Uh, a second thing I think would be looking, and this for me is one of the things that makes the Japanese imperial literature interesting. Japan is, it's, it's never colonized, but it's semi-colonized kind of for a period of time, and then it becomes an imperial power. So this, uh, this complicated relationship, and also later on in the rhetoric of Japanese empire stresses the emancipation of Asia from Western colonial powers. Um, now this is often just looked at as well, this is an ideological fiction, but uh, I think to some extent the rhetoric expresses a, a genuine uh, attitude of the Japanese thinkers at that time. And so I think, uh, you know, this, uh, I think I, I, I refer to this as kind of or oriental 
imperialism at some point in, uh, in, 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 in my book. And, and there's an expression that uh, is now escaping me that Oguma Eiji uses about the uh, Japanese empire. This kind of this empire with a, an axe to grind, and this is an interesting psychological aspect of the Japanese empire. So I think all of these things, I think, make the Japanese empire not a, uh, a sui generis phenomenon, but a more a, a broader uh, concern. I think when we look at the post-1945 uh, events that have taken place since that time, such as, for example, uh, Indonesia's invasion of East Timor and things like that, we can see a similar type of psychology, China's relationship with its peripheral uh, provinces. Uh, I mean, this is a... Uh, the Japanese empire is... Uh, oh, the word I was thinking of is colored imperialism. That's mm. the Ogoma Eiji's expression. Uh, this is a kind of uh, imperialism that has... Uh, developed, I think, after Japan, and probably has a future. I mean, uh, the, the most, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait is another example that we could, we could use of this. Yeah, thank you. Um, your research treats not just inter-imperial colonialist connections, but also anti-imperial ones. How was Japan's first anti-imperial movement influenced by trans-imperial currents? Yeah, I think that's a, uh, there's a clear uh, connection between uh, thinkers like uh, Koto Kushisi, uh, or even uh, Uchimura Kanzo, uh, Osugi Sakai, and uh, European, <coughs> American writers. I mean, I've, I was very interested in my book on uh, Kotoku to see if there was any link with the Anti-Imperialist League in the United States. And I can't see any direct connection, but I, I believe that there's a kind of uh, spiritual connection. The, the direct ties are, are with uh, British journalists. I mean, Hobson was writing around the same time. Uh, he, Kotoku could read English, and, so, and he was familiar with some of these thinkers, and had read some of the books. Uh, he later develops a more economic theory of uh, imperialism, which owes much to his readings of socialists in Europe. And I think that that's true in general. I think that the Japanese saw themselves as part of a, a broader uh, you know, international movement. And the Heimin Shimbun is interesting because they did try to have a dialogue with Russian uh, opponents of the war as well. And uh, this is, you know, Tolstoy, they published Tolstoy's uh, letter, famous letter. Uh, they published uh, other works of, you know, the Social Democratic Party in the, in, within, in the columns of the... Uh, so th this is, they saw themselves, in other words, as part of a global movement opposing imperialism. Thank you so much.